and I went over to uh, our corporate vice president of Motorola uh, and then a deputy director of Google, head of security at Stripe, uh, and then started a little nonprofit uh, organization uh, inspired by um, uh, OSTP out of the executive office, uh, Tom Khalil, who uh, uh, Will knows, uh, I'm sure, uh, as well. So I'm sitting in here in New Jersey, uh, always having fun, always learning, um, and boy, this is just a fun one uh, to watch. And man, thank you so much for the antennae. Uh, gear and kit. I didn't have to build it all from scratch, uh, which is great. Uh, so I'm not sure I could, <laughs> but uh, some of the stuff we saw, other people can. And just seeing the democratization of the ability for people to start to enter this without the barriers to entry, and you know, it's, uh, portends and bodes so well for the innovation coming forward. So thank you, Air Force. Thank you, DDS. Thank you, Tom and Red Balloon Security. This is this is great. Okay. You, you take the next person. Dave Vitel. We're going down by pay grades, I believe. You know. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't. You know, from, from, from the government one. You know, you yes. Where you, know, you go to Scott. You know, I, I, the last government pay grade I had, I think, was GS11. It might have been a high nine. I can't even remember. Because um, that was 20 years ago. So my name's Dave Vitel. I, uh, I started my career at the National Security Agency. Um, back before there were fences, like at every stage of the thing. So, um, like when you go back now, it's like you're entering a bazaar, like almost a prison, but it used to be, you could just drive up to the door and you like talk to the guard and then you walk in the building, which was I, I, much cooler, I guess, much cooler. But I used to, I think probably the thing I was best known for at the NSA was parking in the director's spot every morning, which made them very upset for some reason that I still to this day don't understand. Um, Cause you know, that's just how you do things, the free spot. One team, uh, one and parking lot. One team, one parking lot. So after I left the NSA, I joined at stake, which is where of course I met Mudge and uh, continued to do information security work, so to speak. Um, I've kind of had a, a long history, a long career realistically of making problems for both my adversary and my upper management. Uh, equal equal problems, realistically, um, which I think is the way to live. And so after At Stake, I started a, a company called Immunity. And most people think that all we did was produce a free debugger, which is fine with me. Uh, in reality, uh, we've continued to do a lot of fine technical work, although not in the space of uh, satellites. We'd learn off like we we pretty much stuck to a software layer. And now that I'm looking at all this stuff, it's like some of the things that I have experience in, for example, using uh, TCP connections that go over two satellite hops, which is a very difficult thing to do um, in very weird particular ways. Uh, this brings back wholeheartedly. So I'm excited to talk to everyone about all the stuff this kind of brings into the picture. And it was funny because you know, I remember Dr. Will, I'm going to call you Dr. Will now, I guess. Um, he was like, well, this is year one. And I'm like, Worm was on it for three weeks. This is three weeks, we're, we're in month one. And it's already amazing. And I think already shows that a big changes are coming. So that's what I'm really, that's what I'm most excited about is like projecting, you know, even to the future six months with this kind of technology development is awesome. So I'm going to pick, I'm actually, you know, I think um, I think it'd be awesome to hear from. I hope I pronounced your name right, Bjorn. Bjorn. Fuck. I, or I mean, I totally screwed that up. <laughs> I'm sorry, that Dave. The you, you are the first one actually to pronounce this right. So uh, okay, that's great. All right, perfect. <laughs> so all right, your turn. Okay, it's my turn. So uh, I'm really sorry. I'm also a government guy, uh, but I work. Uh, at the other side of the pond. So uh, I work in Europe, in um, Germany, actually, and I'm a crypto analyst or crypt analyst, to be precise. Uh, but uh, I'm doing all the satellite stuff uh, for, as a hobby. It's not my main job. So it's uh, really cool to see uh, all the guys uh, that I've been writing sometimes at the past uh, who don't even recognize me, like uh, the immunity guy and much. Um, Maybe you remember Team Tezo and THC. So uh, 
Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was uh, I was part of the other group, so uh, old days, but we're talking about uh, the current uh, stuff. So uh, really glad, and I uh, would like to thank you all, everybody over here. It's uh, great to see you guys all over here and also in the chat. So uh, I'm really looking forward what is going to be presented. Oh, wait, oh, so you, you, you pick the next person. Yeah. Well, then it's uh, warm, right? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cameron, uh, also warm. And uh, I've been, I have a day job doing uh, software engineering and uh, some security and pipeline architecture. And on the side, as a hobbyist, I've done a lot of work with uh, Arduinos and uh, recently into uh, space and satellite technologies. Um, I also do a little bit of ham radio uh, work on the side, uh, HF most of the time, but um, I also do have VHF and UHF. And I'm starting to learn a lot about RTL SDR and um, decoding. So um, hopefully soon I'll be an expert in that as well. <laughs> um, Brett, uh, you can go next. Okay. Um so I'm a software engineer as well, uh, IBM here in Toronto. Um, I, I'm actually from Kansas, so I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen. <laughs> um, but like for this uh, for the satellite stuff, like I hadn't really been involved uh, too much till about two three weeks ago. Um, I had set up like an ASDB like uh, antenna outside to kind of watch planes because I'm in the middle of Toronto, so I get a lot of air traffic. But with the satellite stuff, I saw it on Twitter or Reddit or something, and the antennae board looked really cool. So I went there to kind of look to see if we could get a kit, but there wasn't any. So we kind of had to piece stuff together and then uh, ended up building some other stuff okay. along yeah. with it. And I, I learned a ton, like, uh, I learned a lot from Worm as far as like uh, some of the programs they use to track satellites to get like a, a timing and stuff. Like it, it's really been a great, great experience. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, pick, 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 John, pick, John, pick, John. pick John. Okay, John. Uh, hi, John Marks. Uh, I am an Air Force Research Laboratory civilian. Um, I work down in uh, work work in San Antonio, Texas. I get to be a technology enthusiast. I get to uh, basically uh, um, look around a whole lot of different interesting research programs in cybersecurity research and work with our, uh, our operational community and acquisition community. And uh, in, the, in the words of office space, I, I talk to the engineers so the customers don't have to. And I have what I think is one of the, one of the coolest jobs in the Air Force uh, because I get to work with people like Ong and, and all of you on this panel. And, um, and I, I tell you, the, one of the most enjoyable things that I, that I ever get to do is when I get a random text message from Ong saying, John, Check this out. This is something really cool that I just uh, that I just did, and um, and this this panel is uh, and this uh, Niansat project is one of these one of the outcomes of one of those uh, messages. So just glad to be part of it, and uh, um, thanks for thanks for doing what you do and pulling this together. Thanks everyone else for participating in this. Definitely. Um, Trey, Trey you want to give a quick intro? Yeah. Hey. Uh... Trey Cowan, uh, you know, security researcher here at Red Balloon. Um, and, uh, you know, a while back, uh, Ong kind of came to me and said, you know, we've got this really cool uh, antenna tracking board and, uh, you know, let's make a project around it. So I've uh, been working with the team for, you know, the past couple of months here to get everything together. And, um, yeah, I'm glad we were able to, uh, you know, put this on and, and get so many people involved. I think, uh, you know, there's a ton of people that were on the discord and, and talking about this. So um, it was nice to be able to see that community um, kind of grow pretty organically on its own and, uh, you know, see everyone helping each other out. That was a, a really cool experience. So thank you guys for, for all taking part in this. Right on. Right on. And um, so ooh, there's a weird echo. Okay, okay. Much, much better. So, so I think the, I first, think the time first time I met, I met Dr. Dr. Rolfer was when was I was, was boneheadedly welding in the parking lot. lot. Of Vegas. Vegas, I forget outside of which casino, and it was uh, me just boneheadedly trying to make a gun turret for this, uh, you know, cyber, this physical uh, CPF that we built 
to get people to actually hack webcams and you know card swipes and beat that cross turret because I thought you know what can go wrong when you put a 50 cal with a webcam and Windows, right? Cool, good stuff. And um, then it turned out uh, when I was working with John, and it turned out that he didn't want to give me a cross turret. You know, at first we thought that would be cool, you know, for Ong to have one. But then John said, well, you know, I know I said I could maybe do it, but the paperwork, you know, it's so much, who can fill it out? And I said, John, that's okay, don't worry. I'm just gonna go build one. So I actually get, a, I found a 3D model, a very, very detailed 3D model of the cross turret. Uh, it still kind of raises a lot of questions in my head why that detailed model of the cross turret exists. And I was able to buy it for I think $13 on TurboSquid. And it's so detailed that it even has like the, the cartridge return path thing, you know, so for, for like 3D animations, you think, well, why would you need that level of detail? But yeah, you know, the gun rail, I mean, like everything was mechanically perfect for 13 bucks. So I, I you know, got working on the CNC, long story short, you know, we ship the thing, right, to, to the parking lot and it comes in three pieces, which, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware, the crow's turret loves to be in one piece. You know, so. We, uh, in, the, in you know, Red Balloon Spirit, we said, no way are we quitting. You know, we, we went out and found the nearest welding shop, right? And uh, we got some welder supply, you know, glove, mask. And uh, at some point, at one point, I was literally banging on the gun turret with a wrench, right? So for people who play Team Fortress, that's, you know, I said, like, that is a, that's a, that, I, I get a point for that, you know, in life. But anyway, you know, so uh, that's when I first met Dr. Roper, and I, I guess he didn't think that that was a ridiculous thing to do. and. Um, you know, for me, I've spent the last 10 plus years doing embedded security, and the thing that I'm really passionate about is, you know, not only take, taking apart these mystery computers that run the world, but, you know, coming up with ways and doing things to show people, you know, way, new ways of looking at computers and looking at things that we didn't think were computers. And, you know, space, right, it was the perfect thing for, for us to dig into because what it is, I mean, what is it but a collection of possibly legacy mystery computers that, you know, we don't really know all that well, but it certainly does a whole lot of really important things. And if you open up the box, uh, you know, what I love to do projects on is to show people that, you know, once you get enough guts to open the box, the process really isn't as intimidating as you think. And also, you know, hopefully with a little bit of clever engineering, uh, you know, you can also get access to a whole lot of this stuff without having to be part of the government or spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this is where you know, our angle for the Hackersat project was you know, come up with a, as affordable way as possible for as many people as we can to take that first little step into the pond, right? To build something that can get them potentially a little bit to space. And you know, with that, hopefully, you know, we'll get more people to get involved and interested in this thing who wouldn't have otherwise been involved with and also I think we can you know we have tried to you know show that when we say democratize access to space it, it sounds like a good word you know but it's not it's everything right it, you know when you democratize you democratize so it might not always be positive you know so for something like a few thousand dollars all of a sudden in 2020 all of any any hacker on planet earth with three thousand bucks can point to this guy and you know, for those who've seen the, the stream, you know, I bought this ABL Comsat thing uh, that was, I think, supposed to be mounted on a, on a Humvee or something for 1,600 bucks. Not only does it come with an antenna tracker, the dish, you know, the uh, the down converter, the LMB, it also comes with a eight watt buck, right? So you know, if somebody wanted to break a few laws, all you have to do is hit that transmit button, and all of a sudden you're transmitting eight watts to KU band, um, and that's you know, I think a version of what it means to democratize access to space. So, uh, and I think this is why it's so important, you know, we, we have, and actually, you know, I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday about this. I, I, don't, I wonder if you guys will agree, but you know, the equipment that I brought together on this ground station, a lot of it had to be legacy and a lot of it, you know, for example, the Comtech, right? So for people who used to do this stuff, like the CMD 600, right? Some people said like, well, it brings back memories uh, and the back station, right? It's still being used in some places. So, you know, the cybersecurity, the security posture of those things that are actively being used today, uh, I mean, those are legacy computers that were new back in 1992, right? So, you know, if thinking about that, I would say a large part of the security posture of space ground stations today is pretty much as secure as our PCs were circa 1992, right? And 
Uh, let's think back to you know the time between 92 and like 2003. You know, if we repeat that process again if for cybersecurity in space, we're gonna have a bad time, right? Because uh, hopefully we can do better than you know 1998 and, and things like that. So anyway, that's why uh, we created these little challenges to hopefully get people you know act you know together, building new and interesting things. And instead of doing a competition where there's a winner, we felt like well you know. We're really trying to just get the community interested and be inclusive. So let's just let people, you know, let's make a platform that can do something and then toss it out there, right? And let everybody play for a dollar, you know? And hopefully, you know, you throw out some stuff on the internet and the internet throws something back that's interesting. And I am so happy to have everybody on this panel because um, up to two days ago, I was really nervous. You know, I didn't know if anybody liked this thing or if it even worked or if anybody wanted to build stuff with it. Uh, but we have, I think, seven, seven submissions uh, today that we're going to look at. And then internally, this is Andrew, uh, and Paul's somewhere, he's, he's running the, the computer. But, um, you know, we also have uh, two submissions, so that makes nine. But, um, yeah, let's, let's just look at the cool stuff people build, we right, got, and talk about it. We've got about half an hour. We're going to have to run through these quickly. Who do you want to start with? The people on the stream or? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, uh, uh, no, let's uh, people on the stream. People on the stream. All right. Um, you Bjorn, you're first alphabetically. Paul, you want to play the tape? Yep. Okay. Um, well, uh, you can as well. We're pulling out of the. Oh, that's echo. Can you turn your mic off? It is not So, Bjorn, you said? Yep. Can you turn your volume Can you present the, the, the video, actually? Oh. What? The stream is working. Ah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, that's uh, the autonomous uh, satellite tracker. Uh, actually, um, the base system um, wasn't created by me. Um, it was uh, actually created uh, by... Oh, let's have a look. Um, Edward Downey. Um, so, uh, you can pretty much uh, just uh, send you a link. Then you can have a look at it. And, uh, okay, it's not working over here. It's on the stream, right? I'm not sure. I, I need to share my screen here. Okay, I'm just uh, going to talk about it. So uh, I'm going to send uh, the link later on. So um, the whole system actually, um, it works uh, pretty simple. Uh, I posted it on uh, Twitter on uh, hashtag um, 9SubChallenge. And um, you can start it up. It's the same system as uh, the 9 set kit. So um, you've got an ESP, um, you've got a voltage driver, and uh, you've got uh, in front over there, as you can see, it's an L-band antenna, which I used to, to uh, start with because I wanted to see uh, if I could calibrate, calibrate it to uh, geostationary uh, satellites. And then I tried to, to capture even satellites uh, that are on a move, like the NIMA satellites. And that was the start. And it has a really nice uh, web GUI. So uh, you can just enter the satellite, and it's going to track it autom uh, automatically. And uh, what I fooled around it, uh, what you can see, uh, you can't see over there, is uh, I also um, added a system in Python, which is uh, able to uh, automatically detect uh, the satellite by audio so i used um, a shazam engine actually to listen to uh, the frequency and then detect uh, what satellite it is and it's uh, going it's even able to follow uh, unidentified satellites so you can just track them and use the sdr uh, so in the picture uh, just down below you can see the uh, atos uh, b210 and i'm using an uh, lna just uh, directly on the antenna but uh, the system is very, very good. Um, the only costly thing about it is uh, the gears um, from Service City. Um, those are needed because uh, then you can enable more weight uh, actually to the antenna. So that's a small antenna, but you can also use a large Yagi antenna, or you could also use a small satellite dish that works very well. So it's about like um, 20 kilograms uh, that are able um, uh, to be pulled on uh, the antenna. 
Yeah. So, uh, awesome. do you have any questions, actually? Is that our fog machine? We have about five minutes for questions from the panel. Can you re-explain the Shazam thing? Because that yeah. is amazing. Um, the Shazam thing is uh, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, so it's uh, just a Shazam uh, library, yeah. and uh, you're going to throw it into an uh, AI engine. So there's a similar project at uh, RTL SDR, which everybody can download. It's open source. Um, I can post that link as well. Uh, just trying to find it in a few seconds, maybe, or somebody else is uh, able to find it, but I'm trying to find it. Uh, yeah, I got it. So let's uh, put in link in the Uber conference. Okay, so uh, could you please uh, forward that link to the Twitch channel? That would be great. And then we're going to um, so everybody the... can see it. It's yeah. really, really simple. So you can just train um, some modulations um, by the system, and then it's able to detect the same modulation. And it's the same. Uh, so uh, this one uh, from RTSDR it has been run against a uh, database of uh, satellite AI. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of satellites are already in there, like Inmarsat or Fleet.com or something like that. Uh, and it's able to detect the satellites by about 70 to 80%. It's not perfect, but it works uh, very well. So uh, those two systems combined, I hope I can improve in the future. It's right now written in C, but I try to uh, port it to Python, because then it's uh, much easier to script and then to improve things. But it's, uh, the system's already working very stable, and the price tag is also fine. It's about 400 euros, so it's not a lot for the whole system. Uh, the only thing which you, of course, need is an SDR, uh, but you could also use an RTL SDR. But that system is pretty cool because you cannot just receive, you can also uh, send and transmit. For example, I was uh, sending SSTV to the uh, ISS, and it worked pretty fine with the Yagi. That's awesome. We've got time for one more question. That, OK. That's really well done. Um, I have a question. on. What, would, uh, what are some of the ideas that you'd have for uh, tracking, since you have now a gimbal with uh, degrees of movement, and you've got like a Shazam style, let's catch a particular type of modulation, or let's uh, capture as the modulations change. What, what are some things you would envision uh, possible combining those two things? Uh, in addition to maybe the obvious of you know tracking the satellite as it maybe changes, uh, uh, or maybe it doesn't burn to adjust orbit or something. Um, what are some wild things you might think of with that? Well, the wildest thing I could uh, think of is, uh, as you say, democratize uh, the space. Uh, so uh, the coolest thing would be that uh, we would have a web SDR uh, where everybody could listen to uh, the satellites, just pick up a satellite and uh, you're in the stream, you can have a look uh, at the data, start reverse engineering, or even help find uh, security issues, um, especially for the older satellites where it's possible to patch uh, those issues. I think that's very critical. Or even things to see what uh, NASA doesn't see, uh, like, uh, uh, let's say, asteroids or something like that. So uh, the greatest thing would be that we have a worldwide uh, system where we can monitor all satellites, where we can see what's going on, and to help support science and to bring mankind into space. That's exactly the thing. That's awesome. Very, very well done. All right. Brett, we'll get your Thanks. thing loaded up next, and you'll be able to talk about all the cool work that you did. Uh, another little quick follow up before we run out of QA, if you don't mind. Um, were you, uh, and I lost audio uh, during your description for just a moment, so apologies if you already covered this. Um, did, were, what sorts of signals did you see during your testing? What was the range? Was it predominantly, you know, for uh, quadrature or amplitude, or was it, you know, predominantly a particular type of modulation, or did you really get a variety? How noisy were the skies for you? 
Yeah. Well, I haven't I haven't uh, done a lot, but uh, from the stuff I saw, uh, it always depends on the antenna, of course. Uh, there's also there's always a lot of noise uh, depending on where you are. So I'm in the middle of city nearby Munich, so there's a lot of noise uh, coming from the LTE uh, cell stations, um, which burns into. Um, so um, yeah, that's that makes things a bit hard. But uh, speaking of modulations, I think the most thing I've seen on the satellite so far is typically uh, QPSK, PSK, uh, and FSK. So those are pretty common. Uh, and uh, right now there are really cool tools uh, from uh, new radio like GR satellites, which make things a lot easier. But the problem, the main problem, is that there's almost no stuff to educate yourself on that. So uh, there are some small tutorials or something like that, but no really um, hands-on reverse engineering satellite uh, systems. So you have to know people uh, to talk about that. And um, and as you can see, as already talked about, um, the main problem is still that uh, talking about the past, um, when I first uh, let's say hacked, it's not really hacked, uh, satellite, it was uh, monitoring internet streams um, via uh, broadcast satellites. And I thought, this isn't a thing anymore. And just this year, uh, I saw in uh, Black Hat, it is still a thing, which is ridiculous, um, shouldn't be. Um, there are easy ways to protect that. So um, I think, yeah, that's that's the main problem. All right. That's great. I, I spoke imprecisely when I said noisy, and I meant how chatty. But you uh, you answered that as well with the um, phase shift and the, and the quadrature uh, aspect. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have 30 seconds left, but how would you fix it? Given that encryption or other things take energy, uh, and we are working with a very limited amount of electrical or compute energy on these resource constrained devices. Well, the problem is always the satellite, of course, uh, because um, if you have modern technology, you can uh, encrypt uh, the transmissions, for example, uh, like military satellites they're encrypted using AES, or uh, newer ones like the Chinese satellites even use uh, quantum technology to encrypt the stream. So I think that's the first thing to do, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't really protect against insiders, I think. That's the main threat. So if someone is able to get the key, uh, you can encrypt it anyway. It won't help. Uh, and the same thing is, uh, which I think the main issue is going to be, uh, where are you going to buy the chips and uh, what chips are you going to use? So the supply chain is going to be a big problem. Um, almost everything comes from uh, China, I'd say, or some parts from Russia. Even if you try to uh, understand what's going on with that chips, um, you still never know. Great. All right, let's get uh, Brett. We're going to put your video and your picture up next if you want to talk briefly. One okay. Second. There we are. So I think that's it. Um, and then throw up the. From my part. Are you, are you, are you muted? Are you muted? Can you hear us? Okay. 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 Oh, no. Your mic is not muted. Pull up the Vanilla picture. He's got a name. Well, you got to make your sound. Video amazed me so much, I have to admit. Like. It combines two emerging technologies and like I think really demonstrates what's about to sort of wash over the community. I was super impressed with this work. Thanks. I, I have to echo Dave because uh, it, it's a very logical jump from the additive sort of plastics uh, to make, you know, maybe the base parts of the gimbals to then understanding that the 3D printing is now, you know, moving into conductive uh, materials. So the notion of being able to get a, you know, uh, 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 a, a log, log periodic antenna or to really kind of tune into the frequencies as well. I mean, I, because uh, I was kind of like having fun showing everybody, you know, the, the fleet comsat here for UHF, 
it's like you know that was that was a barrier to entry but you know soon we're going to move from just creating out of nothing uh, uh, the, the basic components for the stand the tracking the other components all all the way down to forming the waves uh and really you know being able to pick out um particular frequencies that were not accessible uh to us before this this was a great example and, and, and it makes me uh really excited to see kind of like wow this this opens up a lot of new areas this was well done I'd like to ask uh, specifically on trying to make the equipment itself. What I love so much about this is that, you know, with 3D printing becoming cheaper, more ubiquitous, it just allows us to have more antennas everywhere. And that's a very different space paradigm than only having a couple of places that we can downlink and uplink. And so that, that could be good from a security standpoint, could be bad from a security standpoint. So I just wanted to hear what was the toughest challenge in trying to recreate the equipment you would have normally gotten in a box courtesy of Red Balloon? Uh, so I would say waiting nine hours for something to print and then something not being measured properly. But um, yeah, it was a lot of measuring and making sure everything fit together because you, you kind of got to think about how stuff's going to fit together before you kind of commit to printing it. Because like I said, it could be nine hours later that you get the part and then you kind of, if you messed up, then you just wasted a lot of time. Um, and also like learning the programs and stuff like the CAD programs. Um, it was a good opportunity for that, that type of stuff as well. So, 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 so. I keep, you know, during this project and others, I keep joking with John that was, you know, John just got his 3d printer set up during the pandemic. And I keep taking photos of my lathe and my CNC machine to say like, Hey, check out my 3d printer. Um, so making some things out of metal, it was really cool, but yeah, this is this is awesome. And also, you know, I'm a big fan, a big fan of just having tools that can make things so that you don't wait for that iteration, you know? So uh, even the antennae board, you know, we, we had three iterations of the design of the board, um, and the longest leg of it was, you know, we had to you know, send the thing to PCB way, so that it comes back within, uh, you know, a, a, about a week. But um, in-house, we have our own laser cutter that, you know, sometimes we'll make prototypes of, you know, the board just using, you know, uh, copper clad, right, FR4. And um, the, the little toy that really, really shined through for this whole project is our amazing kick and place machine. So I don't know if uh, you guys realize, and hopefully, you know, we, if you find a, a board that has a short here somewhere, know that all of it was built in house at Red Balloon, you know, this wasn't assembled. You know, I, I was joking with people that were basically fucked Tom West, you know, for the last three weeks. Right, every weekend we would come in and just like run that machine, you know, solder the thing, bake the thing, pick, pick in place. But um, our the ability for us to, you know, have a pick in place and you know manufacture these things in like, you know, small quantities like up to fifty, right? Is um that's been a game changer for us. So, you know, we were even thinking about designing, uh, you know, PCB antennas, right? And you know that's something that's all of a sudden, you know, open to us. So combine three D printing, you know, the pick and place machine, the fact that you still can, you know, send something the PCB way and have it turn around in six days uh, for less than a hundred bucks, right? So this is, um, yeah, a really, really exciting time for people who can make and design things and quickly field it out into the world. I would say on the on the satellite portion of it, at least, like when I like I'm brand new to this, so when I started hearing like the ping coming back from the satellite, like I was jumping up and down, like I got it, yeah. <laughs> But it's it's super fun to track that stuff because you got like a fifteen minute window. It's it's really exciting. So one last. Dude, what are, what's the picture that we're looking at here? Uh, so that's the NOAA satellite. The data I got down from it. Um, I'm in like the middle of Toronto, so I'm actually surprised I it was even able to get this much. But um, but yeah, basically just plug that into the WX two image. Um, like I said, Warm had helped me find some programs to track like when the satellites would be here and stuff. Um, and it's just been fun just like watching it. Like I'll set timers on my watch to make sure that I'm like ready for when it comes and stuff. So it, it's been a blast. What was your start to finish from like, I might do this project to I'm looking at an image from a satellite? I think it was like two and a half weeks probably. Um, I got, I start, I saw something on Twitter or Reddit and then I got involved in the Discord. And then I got some help from people and I kind of helped people too after I figured stuff out and it, yeah, it just went from there. It's been really fun. That's a ridiculous metric in a sense like that. 
by itself is the is the box opening that Ong's talking about. It's insane. Awesome. Yeah, dude, I put I put my STLs out and stuff, so hopefully I'll be able to iterate on that, and maybe some other people can uh, try it out and stuff. That's so cool. That's Glad neat. you put your STLs out because I mean I think that I think there's going to be a magic uh, in space for a while because it has that feeling of like where you know like ham radio or the first time you make your own radio and you get a signal from the other side of the world and it's just magic even though the physics is sound. I, I just think the idea of being able to pull down a ping from a satellite or pull down an image and that's available to a broad community and you're only two and a half weeks away from it. You know, if you follow the path that others have laid, I think that has just a real romance to it. So I'm glad to hear that even the ping from the NOAA satellites was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> All right. So you can also see how this plays into the situation we're in, uh, you know, with with the ability to have tools that make tools uh, instead of, you know, ordering, you know, the parts or ordering an antenna in order to set up, you know, meshes. It's just grabbing the STLs. If, you know, if some people can start to publish, you know, the information to make it. And if you wanted to, you know, start communicating on different sorts of frequencies in a sort of mesh network or monitor large swaths of the sky by having larger amounts of the earth covered uh, with receiving. Um, you know, it's this ability to just download, kind of stay within your area, not have to, you know, kind of go out to places, interact. I mean, we, can, we can do this in a more isolated fashion. And, and I think that's kind of exciting. There are a lot of bad things and frustrating things, but the ability to realize what we can actually create on our own in our own environments. And then to what Ong said, you know, using antennas out of printed circuit boards. Uh, you know, as as he'll, you might recall, we called the fun antennas, the unintentional antennas and frequency tunings that you'll have on particular types of electronics and repurposing it. Um, you know, every crisis is an opportunity. And I think this is kind of demonstrating some of the opportunities we have for creating locally uh, and repurposing things. Um, grabbing new signs and and and, and the, the satellite uh, weather image is great. I almost wanted to say when Dave was like, "What are we looking at?" And the answer is, "We're looking at you, Dave. <laughs> You're in there." All right. So, so in the interest in time, we're gonna uh, keep the show keep the show moving, moving to the next, the next uh, submission. submission. What, what do we have? What do we have? Worm is up next. I think this was the first the first video, video that, that I personally, personally saw. saw. It's awesome. It's awesome. So, so I'm so excited. excited. Bottom left there. Yep. All right, hopefully I'm unmuted here. Just waiting for the video to pop up. Uh, so some background is the, uh, when I got my V1 antennae, I was, I think one of the earlier orders and the, my board had a problem with the USB UART chip. Um, so I took that off and tried to reflow it and ended up having issues with, with that board uh, working even after that. So, um, I instead built a DIY setup, um, which was useful because I've been able to, with that, help debug folks um, across the Twitch community, I'm sorry, the uh, Discord community as well. So uh, what I did was uh, find some mistakes in some of the source code, made some changes on Git to uh, try to free up people to actually use the, uh, the device, and was, I think, one of the first people to get tracking working um, so I used a, I used a, um, a Yagi that I had that, uh, is two meter, 70 centimeter for doing ISS work anyway. Um, and I was able to get some pretty good points on the ISS, uh, the video here I'm downloading, uh, slow scan TV from the Russian ROISS transmitter. And was able to demodulate it with a uh, QSSTV, I guess was the name of the, the software for that. Um, I had also read that some of the good targets were also the weather satellites. So in addition to getting the slow scan TV demodulator, I found a program called um, APT, uh, APT NOA. So I used that as my demodulator to try to get the NOA signals and I managed to get uh, 15, 18, and 19 all in one day. Um, I just got lucky and had three passes in a row. So I just set up on the rooftop and managed to collect uh, a couple of them. You can see this one, 18, was right at the end of the night there. So, 
So uh, yeah, I think that's that's most of the background here. Um, and you know, I've been been involved with uh, trying to get a lot of other folks on the antennae board as well. Um, to me, it was important to make sure that I wasn't the only person who got one of these things working. Uh, both because I could I you know bounce some ideas off folks and uh, perhaps learn a little bit more, but also because I I kind of can see this thing. You know, it's a pretty cheap platform to get people able to contact um, some some pretty cool tech. So, you know, now with things like uh, Satnogs, I'm hoping that more folks can put up some ground stations and make these available with uh, maybe Web SDR or something like that to get more eyes in the sky. This is, this is such, such a, a solid, solid build. build. I, I, man, I, I'm just, this is so cool. And also, you have a really interesting living room. We spent some time talking about that last night. That's just a comment. That's not a question. <laughs> So I, what, I know what is the airplane? Like what oh, is sorry. the airplane? Uh, that's that's a uh, a Russian helicopter. So the transfer, sorry, yeah. I think, was only really supposed to be active during the passes over Russia. And for whatever reason, it was left on for one final orbit. So I actually only had one shot at, one shot at pulling this image. Um, so I got it. And you can see, like, my audio, you know, that it's not the prettiest signal in the world but it was good enough to get some demodulation on. And, you know, of course, I've only had this thing working for two weeks. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of room to kind of improve it, get the tracking working better, um, maybe make some tweaks to the antenna. I'd like to get on to some of the other bands right now. I'm just on two meter, so. That's awesome. It's a, it's a really good example. I mean, from the slow scan TV, <clears throat> Um, the, the, you know, is that an intentional image or not? The intentional ones from the NOAA satellites that because there was such a barrier to entry, because this was like out of reach of mere mortals for so long, there's a lot of stuff that didn't have this in the threat model. And I find it fascinating. And this is why I was always drawn to this. This is why well before, you know, the government, you know, I, I used to follow all the European groups that were doing you know, what they call, you know, uh, spy, you know, um, you know, stealth satellites or spy satellite tracking. There's this community for that because it's this notion of there's something out there that they didn't think of us about and we can actually watch it uh, and we weren't really supposed to. And I find that fascinating. There, there are so many challenges as to do we do a narrow beam versus do we do a wide beam? Well, what happens if we do a narrow beam? Well, we probably have to have a little extra fuel that's a very scarce resource on the satellite because we're going to have to keep repositioning it such the antennas can actually talk to each other versus a wide band. You know, so all of these trade-offs as to the physics, the mass, and and who the intended recipient is. Um, if it's a wide band, how do we get the right people to you know decrypt it? If we even bother, you know, the extra part of encrypted. So I I love the little extra nugget in here that it, it really gets me excited. Of uh, here's a picture of a Russian, uh, you know. Um, helicopter because I'm like oh this is this is the sort of stuff that just I stay up late at night just to catch a number station or something else and here we are all of a sudden going to be able to catch all of this new information um, uh, so yeah this this one got me excited uh, that the range of things you were receiving uh, <laughs> the slow scan TV of, of, the, of the helicopter kudos I, I am curious that there's a question here like what stuff are you kind of excited about seeing that maybe was you know quasi forbidden before now yeah well i mean all of this feels out of reach i think until you get a chance to play with it right like uh you know even even now i've mentioned to folks that i'm downloading stuff from weather satellites and you know in, in their heads i think they're thinking i've got a 10 meter satellite dish pointed up at the sky with you know some crazy tracking and reality i you know um it's not that at all right i'm doing it with the yagi and uh we saw people doing it with the dipoles as well. So it's it's really not too complicated of a setup. And I think now this is going to open the door to tune up a little bit better and start receiving some more of the uh, digital signals. I think some obvious first ones for me are going to be ISS um, and some of the louder you know digital modes. There's a packet repeater up there. So I'd like to kind of get dialed in on that. And from there, uh, you know, I can switch out antennas and go to um, 
higher wavelengths and start pick, pulling down some stuff on the gigahertz range. And that's, I think, where a lot of the interesting traffic is going to be, though. Even this stuff, you know, 60s technology, right, for APT, um, pretty pretty good to be able to pull down and um, definitely super exciting. So That's great. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, you know coming, coming up, up on the, the half hour, I think we're going to go a little, a few minutes uh, longer. You know, for anybody who needs to drop off, uh, we won't feel bad. But um, if you have a few more minutes, we do have some other submissions to go through. So... I think this person's not on the call, but when I saw this, it did make my heart sing a little bit. It's so cool. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I don't know if you guys are wondering why we included a US Robotics 56K dial-up modem uh, into the challenge, but I, I think for the, for the folks on this call, we all sort of understand why. There's at least one in every data center, right, that's hooked up to the terminal server, to the Cisco, you know, switch. Um, and uh, these things are still around. And uh, we, when I was, you know, first doing the the planning meeting for Hackasat, you know, we were looking around and we thought, well, okay, think about the people who are still selling 56k U.S. robotics modems today, right? Uh, nobody's, there's probably not a lot of people out there, you know, buying it so that they can, you know, use their dial-up modem anymore. So chances are, every one of those modems are probably going to go into a data center. Some were important, hooked up to a terminal server for, for backup, connected to that aux port. And uh, we thought that was very interesting because, hey, you know, if you're in the business of changing the firmware of these things and, and then selling it on eBay, you know, boy, wouldn't you get some pretty good access, right? So we looked at and revisited the, the wonderful 56, uh, 56K modem. Uh, and it turns out sometime during, uh, I think, 2003, US Robotics replaced, rewrote their entire firmware uh, they used to have a custom uh, DSP chip that ran all of the code, but I, I'm guessing whichever uh, you know fab that used to make that chip probably no longer exists. So they ported their entire code base to ARM. So all of a sudden, you know, we have these modems with, uh, and we sure know how to modify and mess with ARM, you know, processors and ARM firmware. So you know, changing the firmware on this modem now became super easy, and uh, I didn't. One of my ideas for, for a cool project that I, I didn't have time to do, unfortunately, was uh, to take this and turn it into a acoustic communicator for a submarine, because I, I have this neat little RC submarine that you know I want to control in, in a pond. Um, but uh, yeah, the modem would be perfect for it. And you know, the, the commercial acoustic uh, modems for submarines are super expensive, so I figured this would do it. But yeah, I think this person found like you know this little. Uh, Easter egg of all the people who worked on this uh, this firmware. So, and the dollar sign, you know, AT dollar sign, right? Good command. Um, so, I'm sure there are lots of other things in this firmware that is interesting. And now that we have, we released a little toolkit to, uh, you know, modify the firmware. Right? There's um, all sorts of funny things you can do with the good old 56k. This was one of my favorites as well. So I mean, when when I saw this, I, I think I got just as excited as as um, uh, on uh, maybe even more so. And, and on that uh, little submarine, I've got some uh, sounding torpedoes that give echo responses to mirror certain Russian ones. Uh, maybe we can go and drop it in Puget Sound at some point. Uh, that's a different story. Uh, the the modems um, here. This is so relevant to satellite communication. Um, Motorola burst modems are what's you know doing the communications for Iridium for a lot of low Earth orbit satellites. When you're talking about um, modem connections to uh, uh, IP over satellite, I mean, it, it is all in there. You've got a modem inside your cell phone that handles the Hayes command sets for the cellular modem component. And in fact, um, I found in a bunch of CTB equipment that the indigenous, the domestic um, uh, modems uh, have a whole bunch of extra hidden commands that the export ones do not. And since you're at that low physical level, you can do things like, you know, turn on a microphone, uh, uh, disconnect from the cellular tower. But this starts to play into the, the satellites in an interesting way. Because uh, 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 one, one second. second. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, we just got a call. I think Dr. Wolfram needs to drop off. So we're going to pause a second. Look, I, look I, I'll tell you, I think I've got to jump and do the other Hackensack things, but this was, this just gives me a ton of hope. Um, not, not because we're 
going to be doing well anytime soon in terms of security <laughs> and space. But we do have the right people in the community engaging now so that we can become better quickly. And look, most of the satellite companies that we work with, they're satellite people. They, they've got physics and engineering backgrounds. They know how to make things that can operate in space securely. But they don't have a cyber background and they're, they're usually not antenna experts. And so a lot of what we put up is really based on trying to operate in a hostile environment. And we don't really think about, you know, the, the downstream effects of not thinking through ways to get in, back doors we're leaving open, ports that aren't disabled. And so I hope that as we get the community engaged that we'll do a better job, not just in the military, but like that commercial providers, because there's, there's gonna be like a thousand low earth orbit satellites up, you know, soon selling all sorts of data to us and services that used to be made available terrestrially. And I'm gonna guess that those startup companies that we're super excited to work with now don't have the expertise this community does. So if we get awareness up and just generally raise the hygiene that goes into satellites that are gonna be selling everyone data, then space will be a much more secure domain uh, than the mistakes we made back in the 90s. And I think it was Bjorn who said supply chain is something we need to worry about. Yes, it is. And that's that's not a military problem. That's that's just a global problem. That's going to be a community problem. So maybe in the future, maybe a challenge we can bring back is is making satellites since we can print them now, which is actually a thing. Pretty awesome. Uh, let's try to make things securely with an unsecure supply chain. That would be a really awesome problem for a, for a future DEF CON. So more to follow. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rupert. It's great to see you. Um, I, I wanted to finish this because this touches upon the supply chain uh, that, that Will was mentioning. You know, all of these satellites have modems in them. Um, our you know, equipment talking to them have modems. And you can find some really interesting case command sets. Why is that so exciting? Because a lot of the communications are all in-band signal. Again, it takes more you know, resources to do an out-of-band signaling or to do a secondary radio link. And just like the old days of like knocking people off of IRC by pinging them with a plus, plus, plus ATH zero to get their modem to disconnect on the dial-up, those things start to come back into play here. Um, and you can do this on your own and see this effect. If you run a website, uh, embed some uh, plus 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 ATH zeros right before um, you have an image when it's going down and turn chunking off. And you can notice when somebody with a cellular, uh, with a cellular connection connects to your web page, uh, if, if you don't have that line in there, they get everything and they grab the image very quickly. If they do have it, oftentimes that modem sees the Hayes attention command set and disconnects, and then it has to reconnect again. So you can see this delay before it grabs that image. So this, these are viable attacks just with the cellular infrastructure down here, but they are even more ubiquitous with the cell, with the with the, the radio modems going to space. And this kind of goes to that supply chain of what are some of the weird command sets that people have embedded in there. And if you can ping a satellite, have it ping you back, you know, what can you actually do controlling it? Because it thinks that command came internally, was supposed to be captured and acted upon by the physical device within the satellite. So this is a really, you know, seeing this little Easter egg in the Hayes command set really made me think about, oh, we have like all the old school phone freak stuff and modem manipulations coming back into play with tons of assets that are in space and all the new ones that are going out there from different vendors and manufacturers that have now put in. So maybe, you know, not questionable as in meaning to be malicious, but questionable as why would you put that Hayes command set in there in a way that I might be able to trigger it by getting you to replay or repeat some data back out to me. So that, I love this one. Thank you, Ong, for, uh, for, for, for accepting that and putting it in for that little image. Uh, yeah, that, that kept me up last night. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so when I was... Uh, First, putting together our, our bigger ground station, I, I got a Comtec CMD 600, right? So this is a, you know, like a pretty standard 1990s, you know, like, right, a satellite modem that does transmit and receive. I got it for $19 on eBay, and um, the, the, the user manual was about this thick, and I, I really enjoyed you know, reading through it because it actually didn't just show you the commands, it actually showed you, like, well, here's how all this stuff works. 
which was, uh, you know, I, I think one of my first sort of eye-opening, like, oh, this is the whole network, and it turns out it's not that different from a typical IP network, right? So you have some really funky, you know, like Doppler shift account, uh, compensation and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, it's just modem sending stuff back and forth. And I remember seeing this one little paragraph, and I, I, I just, I chuckled really hard. You can put each of the interfaces on the terrestrial side, uh, on the, the modulation on the terrestrial side, and on, on the far side, in loops, loopback interfaces to test whether your you know, E1 line is correct, or whether your transmitter is correct, right? And then the uh, author of the manual put in this hilarious sentence that says, if you choose the wrong combination of loopbacks, you will create you know, a loop in your network. You know, but he meant like a loop in space, <laughs> right? So it would go on your network, come down, and then get shot into space, and it gets broadcast down. Uh, I, I thought that was, you know, that's a thing that you can do. You can create space loop. And I've even seen that some of these modems, especially with the modern stuff being very cheap, don't care which direction it's going. Uh, I've been able to send information in with the Hayes command set and have it act upon the information coming in as if it was a local command. You don't even have to send it back out. So I, I think this is a good uh, a good reminder of this image that there are some very low skill, low tech attacks, and we shouldn't assume that there's always this really high bar we have to meet. You know, if they're like, oh, but I can't get it to echo the data back out to me, or it echoes it back out in encrypted form, so it's not going to see it. Try just sending the data in. You'll be surprised a non-zero percentage of these modems can be addressed because they just don't expect those symbols to be present on any interface. So they, they lose track what whether it was like coming from an inbound to outbound or outbound to inbound. So fantastic. And, uh, and uh, people don't really use these modems for, for much anymore. You know, so we were um, we visited a ground station. You know, it's not in a large city. It's you know probably a ten thousand people town. Uh, and I thought, hmm, you know how long would it take for me to war dial this entire area to find the two fax modem carriers and I wonder if those carriers are the modems going into the ground station data network right for you know right, you know emergency back probably you know that's probably not that the modems are. are everywhere inside the RF equipment you know you have a modem in your cell phone you know and that is what is connecting to the tower so you have a modem inside the uplink going to the satellite and the satellite has a modem for the actual modulation, demodulation, if it's doing that, not just a simple uh, repeater in space, and they are accepting these command sets. Yeah, I don't see many of the US robotic stuff, um, although if you can figure out how to war dial uh, you know, the Korean uh, peninsula, you will find a lot of modems, um, just hypothetically speaking. <laughs> awesome, all right, so let's, uh, one more submission from the internet, and then I wanna quickly show off the two random things that we did. And then uh, we'll wrap it up. So take it away. Next submission. By the way, this is this ridiculous. is ridiculous. Like, where where is this? I want your lab. That's awesome. Hey guys. So um, this is this is from a while back, but I thought I'd share with you. Um, so somehow I accidentally became part of a student launch satellite. Um, so a little bit about me, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing antenna stuff. I'm a cyber guy, um, really got inspired by Cult of the Dead Cow. It's kind of a, kind of an old group. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Um, <laughs> Wait, that a joke? Thank you. <laughs> So this, these are pictures of um, the business end of the satellite. This is a pulse plasma thruster, which is a, it's a fancy way of thinking about like a spark plug. Um, it ablates in space. Um, so what you're seeing there is a, a aberration from it firing. Um, this, is, this is what we did in our, um, in our Faraday cage um, in Earth and Space Sciences. That's, That's amazing. amazing. Um, it's nice, it's to nice to have a real lab and real toys to play with. I, yeah. I, man. Man. Okay. okay so so maybe, maybe we'll show you what we've done without labs and 
real toys, and I'll show you my laser. Do you want okay. to people comment on Jasper's work first? Yeah, yeah, but you know, before that, let's let's you know let's get some comments and questions on this. But I'll, I'll show you my laser. <laughs> Um, so the uh, uh, question here, uh, ethics. So this is fantastic. Uh, as one of the members of the cult of Ed Cal, thank you for a shout out. Um, and what what are what are uh, if you could list like maybe one or two projects that you did in this lab that you wouldn't have been able to do elsewhere or that you never thought that you would have done? What what are some of the favorites that jumped out at you? Uh, and by the way, I, I was involved with the NORAD upgrade uh, in to, to early two thousands of the before and after, and you look a little bit like the after of NORAD. This is this is crazy cool. So um, let's see. So I was I'm on Com too. I think there was the guy who was here, Doc. Some who was like he had the Boba Fett. So my I was trying to. Uh, Let's say I had a problem. There was a bunch of fraternities nearby that had high speed internet connections. Um, and I was trying to figure out a way that I couldn't be triangulated. So I needed to have a, a directional antenna, right? There wasn't anyone, there wasn't anything like that in the Wi Fi spectrum. So I was looking into like phased arrays. And I just happened to bump into my friend who's a physics grad student. And he was working on this, this pulse plasma thruster. So my background is in COM2. I think it's in the subsystem chart. Um, so we did K, K band, um, reflector ray antenna, um, using new radio and raspberry Pis, Um, and we actually rely on sat nogs and RTL SDRs and amateur radio ground stations. Um, our satellite has actually been, um, given over to AMSAT, amateur satellite radio, um, to be a transponder at HO 107. That's so awesome. That's amazing. That's amazing. Is, is, is this your primary? Um, I mean, is this your huge hobby? Is this what you're obsessed with? Um, like my my whole thing is like, uh, I would say it's, it's really like packets and radio like interfaces. Um, because I feel like there's so much going on there that kind of falls through the cracks of different different industries. It's just it's just super cool to be able to interface with different technologies via radio, via modems, um, especially with some of the new cognitive radio SDR stuff. Oh yeah, were were you were you playing with the old AX.25 uh, stuff back in the day at all, or were you on any of those? those I mean, like this is like Bao, I got a Baofeng here. Like <laughs> that's that's my generation. Um, <laughs> I, I have the exact same one in the other room. I was just looking to see if I could reach over and see uh, how many repeaters can we hit between each other. This this is great. Thanks for sharing. So how far are we from being able to take all these technologies, like the 3D printer, the 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 board, the antenna, all the stuff, and have something that can break through the Great Wall of China? Essentially, like. I, I want to build a mesh network that serves real Twitter unfiltered to Beijing. How far are we from being able to do that? Ooh, ooh, ooh. So, so, so. I'll, I'll say, you know, hang on to that question. I have a, I have a demo for you. Excited about your demo. You, you guys do some of the most innovative, entertaining research I've ever seen, I have to say, from beginning to end. Okay. They, uh, they are a national treasure. Yeah. Well, they're just a treasure period. Let's go do should, Shouldn't have national. All right, with that, that, let's um, let's do some thing. shenanigans. Uh, okay, so this is a project called Mega and Henny. Henny, I think Henny. it was um, I think it was Bjorn who you know mentioned the fact that uh, you know, if you put some you know like a Henny is a small board and people thought it was uh, it was small and it could only lift small things, and like a boneheaded, boneheaded person, person that I am. Um, I, I said that's not true because uh, we actually put four power regulators on the antennae board, so it is a small compact board, uh, but it is uh, it, it's capable of pumping out something like forty five watts of power. All right, but when you do that, the board immediately catches on fire because we didn't include any heat sinks. But that's not technically you know antennae's fault because antennae is small but powerful. So we what I did here is I built a PLTA cooling system, it's water cool, 
I had the uh, heat exchanger off of a truck just lying around in the office, slapped that on with two boss fans, uh, and I welded a custom uh, pipe for, you know, thing that carries the cool water through the power regulators on, on an Henny. Uh, and so, you know, you have this massive thing sinking a ton of heat, and uh, we were able to show that an Henny, mega an Henny, can pick up a big boy satellite dish that's probably, oh, I don't know, like 15 pounds, but you know, that's, that's, it was not even getting hot, right? So, uh, yeah, I guess this was just my boneheaded way of saying like, you know, it might look small, but you know, it, it, all you need is a little cooling. And in fact, the cooling on this is far, it's far more than necessary. And I have a reason for that, because uh, while I was building this, I had the second demo in mind, um, which I suppose we can, well, you know what, I'll let, I'll let O'Brien or Andrew talk about multi and the, what he built and how it works, and then we'll get back to why this is cool, and hopefully we'll answer uh, Dave's question. So a little bit of background on this. I got a text from Mark one, one day, showing me some interesting stuff that he had purchased most recently after watching some previous NBC videos. So he decided that he wanted to, uh, well, I think the first uh, goal with the project that I was working on multi antennae, which it's a command and control protocol for antennas in which there's a leader follower and the leader can figure out where all the other antennas are and then from that make coordinated and track moves over, yeah, here's the video. You can see there's multiple stations and we're going through to point some lasers at balloons. Um, obviously some locations are that because GPS locks is hard inside of a building. But, uh, and we have the fire department calling us for the smoke machines. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, the end goal was to shine 60 watt lasers and balloons to pop down. But, uh, yeah, turns out it's kind of hard to do. So we didn't really end up going forward with the 60 watt laser for fear of blindness. But if you pause there, right? Oh, well. Well, if you pause, you'll see right two red dots on that balloon. And the idea, you know, for for multi isn't just to put it in a room, you know, have it separate by uh, about ten feet. You know, imagine hundreds of these things, even thousands of these, because we can make these boards for fifty dollars, right? Uh, they can pop up. You know, they do support GPS. So if we had hundreds of these uh, all over the world, or even just through, throughout North America or some place, uh, I think we can do a whole lot of really interesting things that just weren't possible, you know, before because, you know, who had a uh, hundred different, you know, base state or ground stations that they can control simultaneously with accurate time sync from the internet. So some of the things that we thought of, you know, I was tossing ideas uh, around with uh, John and I had no idea that tracking spy sets is, there's a community because that's exactly what I want to do with multi, right? So, you know, if you shine a beam into the sky, uh, where you think something might be, but it's not listed, the chance that you'll see something reflected back to you, the perspective of the sender, is oh, basically zero, right? So that's obviously not gonna work. But, you know, if you had 100 friends, or maybe 500 friends, right, with their own little SDRs, you know, like in the tri-state area, right, or across some area, then all of a sudden, I think this becomes much more of a realistic strategy, right? Because somebody might pick up some reflected energy somewhere, and that would give you a great idea about whether there was something orbiting there or not. You know, so the ability for us to make these things cheaply, right, and for people to bring this up and write Python, uh, means that hopefully, you know, with and the, the command and control protocol is already committed, right, hopefully we can start doing some really interesting collaborative stuff. Um, and also part of this too is, you know, this year, unfortunately we're in a pandemic, so, you know, being able to have our little antennae stations join into a greater team effort Right, like regardless, while we're not physically t together, you know, just made me feel warm and fuzzy on the inside, right? So, you know, I think, yeah, being able to put these things together uh, and c controlling them, you know, simultaneously with some intelligence is, is awesome. I think there are tons of possibilities here. And keep in mind, too, that, you know, these things all have, I think one of my favorite sort of aha moments for this project was instead of just making a traditional, you know, ground station that turns with very accurate motors with encoders, but we cheated the system by using an IMU, right? This IMU, you know, like, I mean, that technology is awesome. So it's nine degrees of freedom, it's $15, and it has an uh, ARM M core inside, continuously doing, you know, sensor fusion, right? 10 years ago, that would have been not a thing, but today we can, we have that for 10 bucks or 15 bucks, 
and all you have to do is glue that you know sensor onto your antenna and you no longer have to have you know a very accurate servo or a geared you reducing motor with an encoder right all that power and, and control so you know if you have you know the geographic location you, you know your magnetic north right you can actually use these things well one for tracking space debris or, or spice ads but you know if you mounted let's say a 60 you know watt laser on it right it actually becomes a massive laser weapon and you know you and I think that has advantages over the, you know, the things I've seen before too because I, now that you have multiple you know, shooters or you know, sources of the laser, you don't have to worry about focusing a single beam as much, right? And you know, that's also a thing that we, we wanted to show. Do we have a photo of the laser firing at all? It's Twitch. It's oh, it's on Twitch. Twitch? Oh, you guys should check out Twitch or we'll put it up in, you know, after, uh, uh, in a sec. But, um, Paul, during the demo of the laser, destroyed many balloons. Um, it was it was outrageous. Um, but anyway, so those are two mega antennae and multi antennae. Uh, they kind of work. So those are the two random things that we as a group kind of built internally for, for this. Let's turn Questions or comments from the panel? setting paper on fire inside of a printer if it's popping balloons yeah there's a, a i mean i think real genius really struck a chord with you guys <laughs> thanks yeah yeah you know, you know. Uh, I guess i have one more i guess dumb question which is that you must remember the turla command and control that came out which was a satellite spoofing sort of blind TCP sequence magic. And I was just so astonished and so jealous when I saw it come out. How far are we? It feels like it's to the point now where anyone on this call can do that exact same technique and have completely undetectable command and control with something on the internet. The, the biggest challenge Dave, was to figure out one that was then going to take it on the downlink and convert it over to IP. I mean, you can do that right now with a bunch of the just open repeaters in space. And you could do that essentially at a, at a logical level with regular communications. But uh, yeah, if you find one that's going to actually, you know, uh, unwrap it from the MPEG or from the GSE encoding uh, and, you know, throw that IP back onto a router connected, um, it, it ain't that, you know, it ain't out of reach. This, this video makes me fear for all of your eyeballs. Like, we, we, we if have, you like, uh, we have laser goggles. I mean, we're, we were safe. And, but yes, but yes that, 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 I don't know why this exists. This is a sixty watt butterfly package. You know, it draws like three hundred watts. It puts out blue laser. I mean, the thing is a death ray, right? And the package is about this big. So yeah, that was my idea. You know, you put right three of those on three antennae stations. Man, right? Like that's crazy. Um, and this was only $250 per package. So another one of those, what a weird time we live in where that's possible. And I, I still don't really know what purpose this, like why should anyone be able, allowed to have this? Not sure. <laughs> well, I'm sure they are export controlled and probably import controlled. Are you, how far do those go up? I don't believe so, Dave. Well, I tried to order a bunch of them for, um, <laughs> <laughs> and they got caught in customs when I tried to order them. So I don't know, maybe y'all are luckier at your purchasing decisions. Well, well you, you need to be good at uh, AliExpress. That's the trick, AliExpress. Okay. Are you saying that these, like if you have like 300 of these in Long Island mounted, you can point them up like and reach into space? Is that the theory? You know, no, so, no, no. I'm, you know, and this is a question that I want to leave this panel with, but I'm sure there is a law that prevents something like that from being pointed in the sky. Like, you're not even allowed to point laser pointers, right, at airplanes, but I don't think there is a law because these, these butterfly packages are so new that I don't think they've existed for more than, like, a year. Is there a law against it? I don't know. So it would, like, you know, if you wanted to break that law, you, yeah, you know, you can put 300 of these together 
whatever that thing, you know, whatever you point 300 of these things at will probably catch on fire pretty quickly. Um, and that is, you know, a, a troubling, terrifying thing to think about when, you know, the, uh, the antennae platform can do it. All you need is a little water cooling, right? And you don't have to have this in one backyard. You can put it on every, you know, you and like 20 of your friends can have it in 20 places in the city, right? And, and all of a sudden, like Manhattan can become just like helicopter death zone with lasers. Um, and that's, that's a problem, right? I mean, there's only a few countries on Earth that have an anti-satellite capability net right now, right? That's true, yeah. But I mean, this, this sort of indicates that that is now every country that decides to have, you know, also a 3D printer. It's, unless, it's, unless I completely am misinterpreting the technology, which is possibilities. So there are that's a, bunch a really of bright theme of light that destroys things by burning it. So I think you got general gist of what you're seeing here. So, so Dave, the, the anti-satellite thing is, is kind of interesting because um, there's a lot of atmospheric issues with getting a laser uh, up to uh, uh, the target. Um, it, it works quite well for what Ang's uh, talking about for looking for reflections um, off of uncatalogued uh, satellites, but that's also why a lot of the satellites that don't want to be seen have uh, energy absorbing uh, colors and paints uh, at, at this point. Um, but I, I, what I'm excited about antennae is that you can now start to do a lot of other sorts of passive collection uh, of emanations uh, from some of these satellites that give them away. Much like when the first F-117A stealth went down uh, and the rumors were that it was essentially a check device that said, hey, you didn't shield your electronics correctly. We could see that show up, even though we weren't getting a radar ping. Um, I'm wondering how many you know things with a with a gag or a flock of ante of antennae uh, on particular tuned wavelengths that you can kind of identify when one passes underneath uh, and blocks a particular transmission or what sort of emanations they have uh, by themselves. But uh, as far as everybody joining together with the laser going up, the atmospheric interference uh, is actually something somewhat significant. Um, uh, we did hell ads which was a uh, high energy liquid laser area defense system out of uh, DARPA. And it was a huge amount of taxpayer money. Uh, and it kind of really showed just how challenging uh, that is to shoot things down through the atmosphere with lasers. That's really cool that you know that. Um, I wasn't really, you know, trying for destroying satellites with lasers. Uh, it was really just, really just uh, good I wonder if I, if I could. But um, yeah. certainly helicopters, right? I mean, this will probably be bad for helicopters. That also means that when you don't have the atmosphere, you can do communications to each other at much higher bandwidth. Um, you know, because a very focused communications link, let's say over a laser, between two CubeSats or between two mid, uh, mid orbit, um, mid Earth orbit or higher Earth orbit become way more accessible than communicating to a satellite or a satellite communicating back down where a laser communications component is dispersed so much through, you know, through the atmospheric effect. So lo lots of new options. This is super exciting. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but you know, this is great to see all this stuff. Do, do we have any more on? Uh, uh, no, so that's uh, that's it, you know, um, and uh, I want to wrap this up with uh, by I think tossing out a question for you guys uh, You know, so I was talking to a reporter um, About the fact that yes, I was able to buy, you know, this transponder, you know, an 8 watt KU band transmitter buck um, And obviously that's against the law to to turn on right. I mean, I'm not licensed to do that. I'm in the United States um, So obviously not okay for me, but then I thought well Okay, so if I sail out to international waters, who is the police, world police of space, right? Because uh, if I'm not violating, a, you, you know, like a United States law, what law am I violating? And how do we stop people from, wait, are you space police? <laughs> yes, space police, pull over. <laughs> What, what? Out of the vehicle, sir. Put your helmet on. What no, was I was uh, talking to ethics in chat. Sorry, didn't mean to distract you. Uh, yeah, yep. you know, so that was my question. You know, like uh, when you know when we're showing that all of this stuff is you know really much more accessible than I think a lot of people thought before. You know, how many how many people would be good citizens and respectfully just listen and not do anything harmful, and how many kids or people 
well, you know, go shop on mini circuits, spend a thousand dollars, right? Get a, a neat little transmitter and then point that at the sky. And also what happens if, you know, you start transmitting from countries, I mean, the satellite, aside from the geosynchronous ones, tend to move around the planet, right? So, you know, we're now depending on the whole planet to not do terrible things because, you know, while we're fixing the security of the whole space thing, right, these things are fragile, right? And um, again, it, just the thought of seeing something like 1995 happen all over again to space would be so not great. So I guess my question is, um, now that all of this stuff is accessible, what do, you, what do you think the right thing to do is in terms of safeguarding and regulating space, right? Because uh, it's easy enough to say, well, the United States will just police all of space and we'll just own it. But obviously, I think that has its downsides and mo maybe the rest of the world might not think that's cool. But somebody has to do it. So what do you guys think is, uh, is the right answer? I think it's equally uncool for China to do it. But I also don't know that the world is in a place where we can put together an international coalition that's truly functional on something this big. So for now, I think learning how to deal in a gray space is where we're what we do for cyber as well as space. Unless someone else has a, you know, brilliant idea and a really big hammer. I, I agree with Dave. I, I do think that since we have a large number of the objects uh, that are up there cataloged, um, and there are several other countries as well, that we could police ourselves a bit and set examples and norms. Um, you know, if I look at what Elon Musk put up and like the sort of, you know, the light pollution with a lot of these and the other satellites going through, you know, we don't have anything that said don't do it. There were a lot of other researchers that it's interfering with, uh, even as they try to make them, you know, less observable. It's it's not like that. So kind of you know demonstrating, you know, through your own, you know, policing yourself and setting an example. Uh, I'm not seeing that as much from any of these countries as it's kind of you know the gold rush race still, especially as it's becoming more accessible than it used to be. Um, so I'd like to see somebody step up that way. Uh, but before everybody leaves, and I'll, I'll save this for later, I do want to talk uh, to Dave's point about satellite defense because I want to make sure everybody here knows the cheap way where any one of us can do anti-satellite defense, uh, and it actually works unfortunately quite well. But I want to stay on Hong's uh, topic of the, uh, you know, do we police? What are the norms? You know, uh, how do we handle this without creating just the legacy junkyard of vulnerabilities that we have up there already? from the systems uh, and especially going forward that isn't so fragile that you know uh, anybody who's having a bad day can cause some serious grief. I think, I mean, the, the problem here is though, that every time you bet on emerging norms in the international system, you have bet wrong. And so I think sometimes someone like Ong opens up the Pandora's box and you just get to have all the stuff come out and that's now your stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's yours that, and you get to keep was, it. Yeah, so that's, that's how we live. I, I love Otherwise, that. it's just hope and dreams. Those aren't real. I, I'm actually all for that. I mean, that was my that, that's why I drove full disclosure for so long. I'm like, look, it's just going to come out. It's going to be painful. But the faster we get to the pain, the faster we get to start addressing it. We can't stick our head in the sand anymore. So let's just open it up. There's going to be goodies. There's going to be baddies. Um, you know, this was a little yeah. challenging because we actually physically get in our own way for getting other things up there. Whereas, you know, the software is much more of a, you know, kind of logical or disruption of continuity or operations rather than here we're raining space debris. <laughs> but I'm, I'm with Dave, actually. I mean, I, I like a little bit of chaos. I think the reality is, is we try to regulate. We still get all the pain. Plus, we have the pain of regulation. I'm, that's I'm, that's the fun of it. I'm kind of glad Will's not on here because Will would be like, oh, dear Lord, why would you like this <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> It's true. But I, I, I don't think that, like, I think the other part of it is is, is not embracing the new reality, right? It's, it's, a, it's a form of denial. And so I think sometimes you just embrace it. You're just, like, cuddle up to it, and it keeps you warm at night. That's what it is. It's not a message of hope, though. <laughs> Dave, if you were delivering a message of hope and altruism, and I'd be like, what have you done with me? It's true. This was amazing stuff, by the way. I was blown away by all the videos. <laughs>
Does anybody? I, I know Dave and I and, and Hong, uh, you know, take a fair amount of the mic time. But did anybody else have a comment on Hong's, uh, you know, question and kind of challenge the folks on, you know, how how do we make you know the next steps or move things towards a safer situation or help protect some of the fragility that's already up there in a way that's, you know, economic. Uh, uh, I've just lost the word. You know, fair to all. I think I don't really think that's uh, going to be the case. Fair fairness, uh, especially if you see what's going on with uh, China and uh, Russia right now. So uh, and the U.S. I have to say as well. Um, I think um, the thing is, it's the same situation as the nuclear bomb, right? So uh, we have to have treaties. We have to have uh, rules and regulations. <laughs> we have to cope with it and. We still hope it's going to be the same way, but uh, the only thing we can really truly do is to improve security, to prevent some, let's say, single guys to do really harmful things, like bring down the whole telecommunication or something like that. Because just imagine having a pandemic and losing telecommunication, that would be chaos and dangerous. Very, very good observations. Um, anybody else? Because uh, before we depart, uh, as you mentioned, like the single person bringing down telecommunications since the 1998 Senate testimony where I said, hey, BGP attacks can take down the internet. I do want to leave this one with the, here's how you take down satellites as an individual actor. Um, but, you know, and, and maybe I should share that now because maybe that's an example of, you know, maybe this is the thing we have to worry about and maybe folks can, um, and think about that. Uh, two things come to mind, and I've, and I've seen both of them happen, so, so I know they're possible. One, a lot of the receptors uh, on the radio receptors up in space are very, very uh, sensitive. They kind of need to be, especially some of the older ones. Uh, and uh, and I've seen this in more recent, uh, like kind of IoT devices, but this happened in the larger, older stuff as well. There's not a lot of hardware safety guards in place uh, to stop overloading some of these sensors. So with a strong enough transmission, which normally is out of reach of the individual or amateur, you can essentially you know, blind a bird uh, by overpowering it, it, its receiver and doing damage to it. Um, that is the, the, the leading thought as to what happened to the Galaxy, I think Galaxy 4, maybe it's Galaxy 5 satellite in 1998 that literally took down uh, pager communications within the United States. Um, I have I have some rumors from sources that I trust that imply that that was somebody painted the wrong bird and just kept turning it up. You know, a large a a a, a government painted the wrong bird accidentally or something like that. They had a transmit capability. At least that's the rumor I heard. But the way that um so so that's a risk uh, for being able to take it down at the state level. As an individual one, um, a lot of these satellites, you know, they're running on two things. They've got a little bit of fuel. Uh, and then they've got electricity, and the electricity is normally coming from solar, from solar panels. But the fuel is used, you know, um, yeah. at the end of life to maybe park at the graveyard, but during its life to kind of make sure that you know small, small, minor adjustments uh, to you know, the, the orbit, the little figure eight or teardrop it's doing, or the alignment, um, or or the antennas. And that uplink is sitting in oftentimes in like the 400 megahertz range. Um, now, that's an accessible range to a lot of people. And if you know where to be, that's a range that you can jam. And all it takes is a little bit of denial of service in jamming. And if the satellite doesn't receive the communications which tell it to readjust, um, then if you do this a few times, you know, all of a sudden that antenna is out of alignment or the bird <laughs> is ever so slightly moved. And if you do it right, it's now no longer communicative. So, you know, just a simple, wow, I can get a really powerful transmitter, you know, either make it out of, you know, Alibaba or other parts. I mean, you know, hams and CB folks have been doing this, you know, in violation for ages. You can literally step on transmissions that are important to manually readjust uh, a satellite. And if you do this strategically, you can make that bird blind and take it offline. And I'm just always amazed because the, you know, the threat model was that it required somebody with significant capital and resources uh, and technology to do that. And now we're demonstrating that's not true. 
you know, this is attainable and achievable by just about anybody. So I do worry about some of the, some of the communications that were just always thought to be, if you can communicate, you're good. You're one of the few people we trusted. Um, and that's not the case anymore. So when it's untrusted communications and you have to filter and you've got a system up there that was never designed for a hostile environment for RF all the way up through the you know the, the, the session and the and, and the and the application layer or, or the data that it's telling it, hey, I, I need you to adjust by n, n, n amount of degrees, do a burn for you know however many uh, fractions of a second. Um, you know what do we do about that? Because if you choose the right birds to make blind, that's pretty significant. You know that's that's the equivalent of you know of, of the old you know BGP take the internet down in 30 minutes uh, sort of setup. I think. That's one of the ways. I'm, I'm curious if other people have other thoughts about, you know, uh, single actor, uh, destructive things that they're concerned about, or just like, you know, w what is it we should think about such that the worst case scenario doesn't come as a surprise, to paraphrase the- uh, So, so there's um, one thing that I, when I first looked into this, I heard about, and I, I'll be honest, I didn't do the math myself, but it did scare the crap out of me when I heard it, where there is a threshold, there's a critical mass potentially where if we have you know, a collision of uh, bodies within a specific range of orbit, that we can create a debris field so large that we might entirely lose you know, that orbit, right? Because it becomes a uh, cascading event that looks a lot like an explosion, right? You have you know, two satellites that kills eight, then boom, exponential. Um, and the thought of us not doing the right thing and having that happen either through stupidity or through intentional offensive actions uh, made me think that you know for the first time we might actually by we I mean my generation might actually significantly do way worse and live in a less technically capable like reality than my our parents right just because we lost space you know it's kind of like a sing out of idiocracy I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, but you know, a lot of things are happening these days, but if space becomes one, man, that, that would suck. And I, I talked to some people who said, well, you know, do the math, we're not worried, you know, we're years away from that. And I said, years? That's not a lot of time, right? So uh, I would love to see if you, what you guys think about that. And man, just the reality of potentially losing access to space for a decade is, it's a little embarrassing, you know, if, if that happened to us. The, the people who do who say, well, the math isn't there are not the same people that are saying, well, the chances of that happening accidentally uh, is extremely bad luck. That's very low. But what they don't realize is that an adversary can manufacture bad luck, you know, by intentionally moving things. This is like people saying, oh, I've got a hash table. The worst case, you know, a big O notation is a degraceful linked list, but that's really bad luck. And then you realize that an adversary can hand in information and data that forces it into the worst case runtime. So um, I do worry about that because you know maybe it happens by accident that would be extremely unlikely, but maybe a few other things happen. You know, with just a small amount of push, and you know we make we make it you know a, a challenge for ourselves. Remember, these things have to be super light. There's no shielding to stop debris from going through them. That would add to all of the weight cost for you know getting it up in space there. So they're very thin skin and debris is a real problem. Yeah, and I was and looking I was... at the stats. Um, I think for NASA had a stat where, you know, for every launch of the space shuttle, they there was something like a 33-ish percent chance that the, the shield, the windshield, would be damaged enough that it warrants a full replacement. And they were able to see that debris, you know, destruction go up over the years, right? So clearly we have more and more degree, uh, debris that was, you know, like they're, they're tiny things with like massive amount of speed, right, of velocity. So yeah, like uh, I think the numbers are going up, you know, and also, yes, like intentionally crashing uh, or disabling, you know, like one of these satellites is a thing. And also, I'm sure, I think uh, Hacksat, the main CTF is wrapping up now. So talk, let's go talk about that, right? Like, uh, you know, I think that the final event is turn the satellite around and take a photo of the moon just to show that, yes, of course you can, com you know, command and control these things from Earth, but you know we we are also crashing you know satellites by accident, right? I think there was a, a few years ago, at least the U.S. and a, 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 a Russian satellite that just collided, uh, creating massive debris field. And China just went off and blew up some of their own satellites for fun, 
you know, that still people have to navigate around on a weekly basis. So I don't know. I think that this is, um, yeah, I think you're right. You know, the people talking about it, saying this is not a thing, is assuming just good intentions and accidents, right? But we're, as hopefully we've shown here and through Hacksat, we're living in a new reality where, you know, we've democratized like access from malicious actors into space. What? One of my favorite cyber fast track projects that nobody really heard about was a satellite anti-collision um, between spy satellites. And I'll say spy satellites, it wasn't worded that way, but it's when you have two satellites where you don't want somebody to know what the orbital pattern or the velocity of your location is, and you need to communicate to each other to figure out if you're going to hit or not. How do you do that without sharing that information with another country that you might not want to share it with? And it turns out, homo this is this is what partially homomorphic encryption, you know, is actually very good at, where you can do computations, see that they're right, but not actually know what the values were underneath it. So possibly there's some play with uh, homomorphism, or, or fully or partial homomorphism, uh, for the mathematics field, uh, you know, Frank Gentry's uh, stuff that can come into play. And you know, I worry about the satellites that um, are, you know, hey, we. We don't, we don't want you to track us, you know, and then how do we say, how, how do we do our calculations to make sure that those aren't where we're accidentally moving? Um, and they have limited fuel cycles too. So yeah, it's it's getting interesting up there. Uh, if, if folks follow uh, Jonathan McDowell, he's out of the Smithsonian Observatory in Boston, and he does a lot of interesting sort of offensive theory, uh, but he's also largely about tracking satellites and, and launches and, and the debris. He's, he's a big, he's a fun, uh, follow on Twitter. I'll try and find his uh, handle because it seems relevant to this discussion. Yeah, and the the wait, uh, hold on. Yeah, and the yeah, fact, and the fact that, that, that I, I learned that inspector robots or inspector satellites are a thing, or you know, there there are satellites that mechanically attach to other satellites and then poke them. Uh, makes sense that they exist, but the fact that those exist, I think, is definitely showing sort of a trend of where things are heading, right? We're, we're not going to behave in, you know, friendly, in like a whole hundred percent friendly way for the betterment of all mankind. You know, we might start being adversaries in space and that is sort of troubling. I want to take a few audience questions before we end. I've got a few. Uh, you know, so if you guys, if you guys don't mind, mind, we have um, like one or two questions from, from uh, Twitch and then after that, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, but first, I want to say thank you for everyone, for all the, the folks who came on this panel. Um, and thank you for everyone who spent some time playing with the Antenna board and followed us on Nyansat. And of course, thank you Air Force and Dr. Roper for you know, just gathering the community to do something like this and Hacksat. Um, it's been a huge amount of fun. I, if you look at our happy faces, we're all super tired. You know, doing DEF CON remote doesn't actually make it more relaxing. Uh, I think we're all about to like, I can't wait to go home and take a bubble bath is what I have been saying all morning. So, you know, with that, Chris, you wanna read some questions and then then we'll wrap it up. All right, good. I good. gotta get something to drink beer. So, questions from the audience for the, questions from the audience for the panel to address. First up, how likely is it that somebody will accidentally DOS a satellite? Um, I, I'll, I'll take the first one on that. I mean, if the rumors about the Galaxy 4 uh, satellite are correct, of what you know made it go dark and took out a third of the U.S. Uh, pagers, you know, doctors and everything, then it, that's already happened. Um, similarly, I would imagine, you know, with the repositioning being in a you know 400 megahertz band, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if other uh, debris or systems, you know, get in line with the communications, especially if it's very unidirectional, and that it has happened. Um, you know. It, it's a very difficult situation. Once you get that thing up there, you're not going up there to fix it. Um, you know, so if things are wrong, or if things are fragile, or if you've got a bug in the code and you happen to, you know, uh, excite it through communications, I mean, you can DOS things pretty pretty well. Um, we don't know a lot of the reasons on why some of the satellites, you know, we lost control before we thought we should have. Who knows if that's actually, you know, spurious RF or something else that was then processed and parsed and said like, oh, I think this is a command, but it doesn't make any sense. So DOSing satellites seems very plausible to me. 
uh, not just from jamming, but also from essentially, you know, simple fuzzy um, of, of how they do it. Because they just didn't expect um, you know, un incorrect data to ever be presented to them in many cases. Anyone else on Gaussian satellites? Out and say, you know, any DOS that I can identify in a satellite, maybe I can turn into an RCE. <laughs> well, I, I think that's going to be the really interesting thing is can you trust your satellites to provide you a strategic layer at all? Um, and I, I mean, I don't think this is a new question or even a question of the last couple decades. I think this is an endless question that we've always asked is how much do we really trust them? Uh, so, uh, here's so here's the thing, the thing that I'd like to add, you know, so, and this is a great, well, okay, I think that to me at least this is a question of how to conduct ethical research, okay, so clearly satellites belong to not you, right, they belong to other people, maybe military, maybe private corporations, and it's not like you can run the software inside the satellite in a VM and fuzz it. So, what is the right way to do, you know, security research, because I, I, I remember you know, thinking back to the uh, the Osmocom crew, you know, that, you know, poked at GSM, right? And there was, you know, controversy around that because uh, they were able to crash, you know, ground stations with BTS, right? Uh, you know, within a week of fuzzing the cell network, which, you know, does obviously cause harm. But, you know, if no one is allowed to talk to these satellites, we would never progress in terms of, you know, for example, how do you know you can get an RC, right? if you know you're never allowed to send packets to a satellite so what do you think the right way to do security research in this area is i'll start with mine i mean i've, I've been playing in this area for i mean 20 30 years not not as <laughs> avidly and as engaged as everybody else but it's been a fascination of mine i, I got to walk in the payload of the uh, first shuttle before it uh, took off, uh, because my, my dad had projects in it. Although the first one, everything stayed dark. It was just, I didn't understand it, I was too young, but I see these pictures uh, of myself. And for me, it's listening is fine. And you can do a lot from receive. Now, I love the notion of transmitting. I mean, if I'm messing with my garage door or my car or anything else, or you know, a, a pager, you know, I, transmitting is really fun. And, and you can kind of understand how weak things are, uh, as I just mentioned, but they're not expecting hostile data. Uh, and you can make the inference that, oh, dear Lord, you know, the satellites must be in the same situation, probably even earlier, because the designs of the satellites happen, uh, you know, many years before they go up, and you are not changing the components to more recent ones. I think the story about the space shuttle was it was still flying with vacuum tubes, um, and they could have replaced it with CPUs uh, and transistors, but that would have changed the mass measurements and it would have changed other things. And it was designed, you know, a decade or so, you know, before. So think about the satellites being very, very old. Um, go in receive mode uh, and receive to your heart's content. There's so much fun stuff. And then make inferences about what the risks are based upon what we see terrestrially rather than actually you know diddling the satellites or you know sending up uh bit streams um now it, that's that's to me the more you know how, how i self-police and self-monitor but i'm curious how other people think about um you know eth ethically dealing with it or uh, hd Mort uh turned out all those bugs in vxworks and we know that vxworks is is running on many satellites it kind of goes to the dos but it also goes to, you can do some research here without having to have the live uh, satellite, you know, up there. There are differences in atmospheric interference and other stuff that you can't really simulate as well, but those are my, those are my moral rules for self moral rules. I think, I mean, you bring up H.D. Moore, but one of the other projects that he's involved with is of course, scanning the whole internet all the time. And there definitely used to be a you know problem with when you scan the internet like lots of old equipment on it would crash right so but now we just exp we just say listen we're going to be mass scanning all the time and if you're exposing information equipment on that internet that crashes then frankly this is your problem it's definitely not our problem 
And I don't know if that theory changes just because the equipment has happens to be, you know, way up in the sky somewhere and really hard to replace. And maybe it costs you a lot of money to put it up there, right? Like you need to design your equipment to a certain standard. And that standard is you can receive some things and not fall over immediately. And so, yeah, I, th- I, I don't know that if I would personally start transmitting a bunch of stuff up there, but if it turns out that some hobbyist ends up sending some information up to a satellite and that thing crashes, then I'm not going to blame the hobbyist, to be honest, ethically, because I, like, I, I, no I, better stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, but it's kind of, you know, part of that is, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm fine with that. There's, there's a nuance in, in what uh, like Mascan and everything else is doing they're not intentionally trying to fuzz TCP IP stacks. They're actually sending some variation, which is a little bit like fuzzing, of things that are allowed in the protocol specs or within frames, looking like they're designed for these systems that were intentionally connected. So if you're doing that and, and you say, hey, this is an are you there signal in a well-known protocol, you know, and you're sending it up to space to see who's gonna come back, I am perfectly fine with that. The, the people who are manning or controlling, or I should say personing, uh, the satellites up in space need to know that that is coming. And, and yes, it's on them. And you know what? There are going to be some abandoned birds that are listening that nobody owns anymore, or the division or department, you know, has gone away. And other folks are going to have to worry about, hey, if that thing goes belly up because somebody says hi, you know, in, in, a, in a protocol that the rest of us have to worry about that. Um, so I don't think the scanning is, is, is a problem for very simple sort of hellos. I think if you paint a bird and then start to try and go deep, like spike, you know, sort of stuff against it, that's the difference uh, for me. And, 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 and I'd rather do that on a target that I can as closely emulate, you know, terrestrially, such that when something horrific happens on that target, I'm, you know, up in space, I, you know, I mean, yeah, I kind of really tried to go deep into its guts. Now, uh, there's, there's a train of thought that would say, hey, that's fine also, you put it up there, um, and you just made a bad assumption about your, your, your threat models because 40 years ago, 30 years ago, nobody could do that. And now folks can, and you don't have a defense against it. So do them on you. Yes, build, build good stuff going forward. Um, but you know, the, the older satellites that we can talk to never thought we were gonna be the ones talking to them. And I think saying hello is fine. And, and I think that that is uh, expect, we can expect the owners to say, yeah, somebody else might try to say hello. But to really hammer on it, I think that for me is possible. But they yeah, say, I, would just say, I would just say on the ground as well, you have options as far as shielding network equipment off and things like that. If you're in space, you don't really have those options because like somebody could just flood the entire RF spectrum and then you're 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 out of options at that point. All right. So one, so one, last, last, one last question. And this is actually something that came up in yesterday's stream and I thought was a really good one to end on. What can random Twitch viewers or us participants at DEF CON do about space security? How can we make this situation better? Buy more antennas. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> actually not far off though. I mean, the more, the more uh, public awareness there is, the more folks start to you know, share what they're finding and what they've built. Like, all of a sudden, if you start to say, hey, look at this, um, uh, you know, look at these pictures of Russian, you know, helicopters, and it, you know, and it becomes, you know, newsworthy or whatever, that raises the awareness to a lot of the folks building the next generations, um, you know, or, or, or maintaining the current and previous generation ones. So if you are interested in satellite communications, you know, go get some RF, you know, some RTL SDRs, some PAC RFs, some air spies or some some up and down link converters and start playing with some of the stuff and listening and point up to the sky and kind of, you know, you know, get involved. I mean, the more you talk about it, the more excited you are, the more attention that's going to drive to it. And honestly, without that attention, you know, we'll end up in the same situation we are over on computer security where, you know, we've got database administrators who've gone through like a master's degree in optimizing a database. And you say, what about, you know, SQL injection? And they go, what's that? Um, you know, they're, they're just not this awareness that's then baked into the education part. We need enough awareness and enough interest that it starts to become baked into general um, you know, uh, design and management instead of just a special niche uh, where it says, oh, there's the security folks over there. We'll take a special one-day class on that. No. Um, the more we do here, 
the more stuff like Worm, uh, the more stuff like everybody else uh, of, of the demos that, that got in there, and the more excitement, you know, the more it has a chance of driving it into the mainstream, and then it becomes just part of, oh, yeah, we always have to deal with this because this is that community that's out there. Don't, don't go down the road of like the, the computer security community where that's still a niche market and it's still something bolted on after the fact. Go down the way uh, environmental engineering did. That used to be like computer security. Nobody did it. You could become a specialist in it and, and, and then you're a host, just like a computer security specialist. You're still a janitor when it comes up to things, you cleaning up the really stupid things. Environmental engineering became so important and so well known that they had to then go introduce it as part of the core curriculum in all of the other engineering ones. So if you're doing civil engineering, if you're doing electrical engineering, you don't get a one uh, a one day class or, or a, a sidebar on it. It's part of everything. You know, you don't have to be an expert in it, but you definitely are very comfortable with it. We need the satellite communications to have that adversarial aspect of the security interwoven throughout all those parts rather than be like computer security where, oh yeah, we got one day on buffer overflows and then we're right back to like, you know, writing the insecure code uh, that we're doing. So yeah, I just think keep doing what you're doing, build an antennae, grab some different RF stuff, start decoding, start sharing some of the stuff that you're like, this shouldn't be public until it becomes part of the public uh, conversation. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think, you know, what you said before about, you know, the, there's an easy line to draw in terms of responsible behavior and security research here is to, yeah, you know, to listen carefully, right? To listen to what is being sent down to earth and from that potentially infer uh, security issues that might be there. So I think, you know, part of um, the reason why we spent all this effort building this antennae board and, you know, trying to get people to take this first step to play with things like this is um, I hope we can create a community of responsible security researchers that can point out uh, issues that can be fixed in space without causing harm, right? Because uh, I would love to see, you know, the security community do this without accidentally making a satellite fall out of the sky, right? So that we can constructively and responsibly help, you know, improve things little by little. Um, and uh, I think that's the first step is, yeah, get a radio and listen to the sky, right? See if you can see something that's wrong. And uh, hopefully we will do this without actually breaking anything that's expensive or puts you know, people or things in danger. Um, I think that's really important too. Okay. So, man, I think, man, that's, I think that's, that's it. I cannot wait to take a nap. I, I, this, is, uh, this has been great. I thank you guys so much uh, for taking your time, both the panelists and all the, the other people who played with our toys uh, and submitted cool things. Um, you know, DEF CON is coming to an end, but I, I don't see why the Henny project needs to. In fact, we're definitely we're releasing version three of the board, uh, and we're gonna keep on playing with this stuff. So, you know, let's um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you guys later. And thank you for uh, you know spending time here. All right, take care, stay safe, don't die of COVID. All right, All right talk, talk to you later. On um, um, out. Bye, everybody. Yeah, he had a training patch. Anyway, congrats guys. It's done. We're live.